the challenge, the opportunity to connect. The 1960s, a time of imagination and change, a time of anger and fear. The 1960s, a program called Challenge. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Looked at our connections, our divisions, through the lens of faith. Nearly 60 years later, during these challenging times, we'll take a new look at our divisions, our connections, in a new program called Challenge 2.0. The physical threat of the coronavirus pandemic is obvious. We only have to look at the daily statistics of people newly infected and those who have died. The more subtle danger is the impact of both the virus and the social distancing on our emotional health. In this episode of Challenge 2.0, we welcome the return of the Interfaith Amigos, Rabbi Ted Falcon, Pastor Dave Brown, and Imam Jamal Rahman. They will examine the threat that the pandemic poses both to our mental health and then also offer some strategies to help us find peace and a better sense of resilience. Well, thank you, each of you, for joining us this morning. I would like to introduce, once again, the Interfaith Amigos. If you're able to see the full panel, you'll see Imam Jamal Rahman right next to me, Rabbi Ted Falcon, and Pastor Dave Brown. Again, thank you so much for taking your time in a time that is very difficult for all of us to cope, and certainly everybody watching to an even greater degree. As we start uh, in this program looking at the emotional challenges uh, beyond the physical ones with uh, uh, coronavirus. Uh, I wonder if perhaps each of you could share your personal journeys, your experiences with this shelter in place and with the COVID pandemic, uh, perhaps your biggest challenges and what has proved to be your most successful coping mechanism. Trying to balance uh, how much focus I place on what's happening in the news every day and how much I turn away from that and uh, reflect inwardly and uh, nurture my, my spirit. Uh, where do, how do I understand what is um, reasonable apprehension to have in the world and what, um, what when apprehension becomes too much and I, I become paralyzed, uh, trying to um, balance missing world a world where I was present with people, to uh, being thankful for the world where I can be quiet and still in my own home and present to my partner. Uh, so what is difficult is, of course, uh, everything has changed. Uh, you know, I, I, I work at the Interfaith Community Sanctuary. It's a place buzzing with people. Uh, when I meet people, it energizes me. And suddenly now it's um, a lot of isolation. That's one uh, change, big change. Uh, and number two, you know, everything is online, not by meeting people uh, directly. And how do I cope with it? I always remind myself of my favorite uh, saying, blessed are the flexible, for they will never be bent out of shape. I remind myself, be flexible, Brother Jamal. And secondly, I practice silence. I find that for everybody, for myself, for others, uh, this is a critical time to really become centered and cope with everything that is happening uh, through the practice of just any way we can, pure silence. Following that, my wisest choice would be to be silent. Um, <laughs> however, I know that that is unlikely to um, play very well on uh, this recording. You know, so I kind of echo what my brothers have said. Uh, I think I met the early moments with a kind of disbelief, um, a great deal of confusion, uh, an incredible opening of uncertainty. Um, I was among the earliest uh, among us to realize that um, it was critical to restrict my activities and to urge uh, larger groups not to get together. Um, it became clear from the Wuhan experience that people could be contagious without symptoms. And once, once one knows that, then to say, oh, just don't go out if you have a cough or a fever, winds up being meaningless. So not wanting to be part of the problem um, I, I made the choice not to appear publicly, 
um, which actually in the early days brought um, discomfort from um, the, the places I had made speaking engagements. Um, it took several weeks uh, for that kind of awareness to permeate the larger uh, culture uh, to have us all realize that it's in our interactions that we actually were in danger of spreading and making things worse. It strikes me that one of the real emotional costs of this, each of us are showing up in our separate locations right now, is that of loneliness. And I was curious to read that the British government actually instituted an office of the Ministry of Loneliness. And uh, I wonder, in each of your perception, how much of that arises from the circumstances of the shelter-in-place orders, the, the realities of uh, developing a means, a strategy of uh, responding to the COVID threat, and how much of that is simply a lot of our uh, unsuccessful coping strategies are being shown for what they are, and that is not really an effective means of connecting us with others. Uh, you know, loneliness, of course, is not a problem unique to the coronavirus. Uh, this has been a perennial problem, uh, loneliness. And I would say several reasons. Now, one is uh, we're not in touch with ourselves. And essentially, uh, from a spiritual perspective, uh, I am lonely if I have not connected, bonded uh, with my own, you might say, higher self or my, the real me. Second one is, uh, there's so much emphasis on being an individual. We don't always cultivate uh, what is called a circle of love, a, a, a community. Uh, the third thing, which is a little mystical, is that we'll always feel a sense of loneliness because we are separated uh, from the source. Uh, you know, there's a wonderful uh, mystical saying in Islam. Uh, you know, I'll put it in terms of Seattle. Here I am in uh, Seattle. Uh, and yet my heart longs for Seattle. Uh, what is it that I want really? But this situation of uh, lockdown, uh, being isolated has exacerbated all of that connection with self, meeting people in person, and the realization that we are basically lonely. I've often felt that there is a, part, a way in which loneliness is essential to the human condition because there's a part of us, no, but we want people to know and we want to share and that we are unable to share. And coming to terms with that is part of our maturity, I think, is that there is a part of us that is unique only to us um, and that we need to claim that as ours and we can't share it. Where I sense the loneliness in others, um, I feel a great deal of compassion. I have connections with the special needs population. Um, a daughter that has Down syndrome. And she is trying to come to terms with not being touched anymore or not being hugged mm -hmm. by her mom. And that sense of loneliness that I feel powerless to do anything about except to feel a deep compassion and empathy. And I think cultivating that compassion and empathy is something we're called to be about. I, I think uh, you said some very uh, important uh, aspects of what loneliness is, Brother Dave. Not, I, not only are there things about us that um, we're unable to share, but there are things about each of us that we don't want to share. And there are things about us that we just assume other people not know about. And there's a kind of aloneness which is literally part of the human experience when we yes. are operating on an ego level, uh, which continually reminds us, and particularly at a time like this, exacerbates the issue, reminds us that there is a level at which we are never alone. Uh, we are never lonely, but that level is not on the physical. That level is on the spiritual. And I see it as a movement from lonely to alone to all one, which is a uh, uh, transcendence of the physical separation and an embrace of the spiritual connection. And one of the gifts of this time is support for remembering that no matter how things look, 
uh, in the physical world, no matter how separate we appear to be from each other or from our planet, we're really all part of a single presence, a single being, a single life. There's also still that sense of missing community. Is there a way in the situation we find ourselves to create or sustain that sense of community and perhaps some new ones we didn't consider before? What have been your experiences with that? I think most of us are finding that we are doing our teaching online. I am starting to get used to speaking to this little black dot at the top of my laptop screen um, and feeling comfortable with no longer having the immediacy of a response, you know, of a community, uh, but falling into that space of connection. I think, I think all of us are discovering new ways of working and new ways of connecting. Brother Jamal has said that one of the differences is that when we're speaking to a group online, it's possible to see everybody's face and everybody's seeing each other's face where normally everybody's looking up at just a speaker. And this is actually providing a context in which we can appreciate all of our faces kind of coming together, coming alive on a screen. It's one of the gifts where we get to see people we're talking to and hear them, you know, and have a, a kind of communication which strangely uh, honors a, a kind of connection which is surprising. It isn't the same as being physically present, and I needed to wrestle and ponder with what I'm missing. Uh, the casual interaction over coffee, the walk to the car where you learn something new about a person, of uh, sensing energy in the room, and I make no um, claim to think that this is that those things are present in this interaction. So as I name what is absent building on what Brother Ted said, I get to claim what is different and unique. So I'm, I'm not forced to deny the fact that I'm missing something because I am missing something, but I'm getting something else. So rather than using labels like, which is better, I choose to use labels like, there are two different ways of gathering. Embrace a world of just different things. Things are different, not always better or best. Uh, very critically, urgently, uh, essentially, even prophets sought companions. Uh, you know, a wall standing alone is useless. Add to it other walls, it can support a roof, even a granary. Uh, but I'd like to suggest uh, a, a sort of a meditative practice which is very central to Islamic spirituality, where we go into our meditative state, into a happy place you might call our sacred sanctuary. And there, uh, through our imagination and intention, we summon uh, anybody who passes three gateways. These could be people who are alive, who are deceased. Uh, it could be uh, animals living or deceased. Uh, it could be uh, people from the angelic kingdom, uh, Merlin the magician, imaginative kingdom, nature. But the point is that whoever appears, whoever you summon, they pass the gateways of love. There is love, there is trust, so you can be vulnerable, and there's an aspiration for truth. And then all one has to do is just be in the embrace of that inner circle of love and just feel loved. Allow oneself, give oneself permission to allow that love to just flow, to nurture, to nourish. Because ultimately, you know, the cliche is it's all about love being loved, not being loved, and wanting to be loved. It's all about posturing. So if you go in that inner circle of love, it has a deep, deep impact. At the same time, we're looking for different ways to set community. As we record this, there is no uh, definitive end to the shelter in place orders, the lockdowns. And we're told that an important thing to do is to cultivate a sense of hope. 
Uh, I guess, what does that mean to each of you and how do we go about doing that? Hope as I look at it in myself is twofold. There's a hope of what happens in the outer world and there's a hope of what happens in the inner world. We're so used to depending on conditions in the outer world to help us know whether we're happy or unhappy. And this is really a practice in a kind of a self-correction to notice that actually, uh, as long as we rely on conditions being the way we want them to be, we are trapped. We are victims of circumstance rather than free beings. So my hope for the outer world actually is that things don't go back to business as usual, that somehow we're learning something critical at this time about the consequences of our of ceasing from con constant consumerism and going and getting and being busy out there. And notice that the streams and the rivers are <laughs> restoring themselves the animals are coming out the air is cleaner it's like the things that we need to attend to if we are to survive on this planet are reflecting the significance of our of the change in our external circumstances so i do not want to i do not hope that everything goes back to business as usual on the inner on the inner, I have the hope that we remember more fully the one we are. There's a statement in uh, Psalms that says, Shiviti Adonai Negdi Tamid, I set the eternal before me always, which is to say, I focus beyond my ego, I focus beyond my sense of separate self on something which is enduring, something which is eternal. And my hope is both personally and communally is that we remember we remember that the deep true source of happiness the true source of love is within each of us not determined by external circumstances there's a huge difference in my world view between looking on the bright side to having an authentic hope that's grounded in a trust in the spirit that is beyond us, a trust in our mm -hmm. sisters and brothers, and in the case of, of this epidemic, a trust in the professionals that are trying to deal with it and heal the world and heal. There's a wonderful spiritual saying uh, in Islamic spirituality that miracles dwell in the invisible. So hope really is feeling there are possibilities, positive possibilities, uh, rooted in faith, in, in something higher than human personality. You can call it truth, justice, uh, compassion, love, call it God. So the Quran says again and again, to have hope, please be conscious of God, be conscious of God. Uh, you know, the mystics say, uh, be conscious of that invisible hand that moves around our bird cages. And if you're conscious, then sometimes in times of difficulties, help comes in ways you cannot even imagine. Uh, that 13th century sage Rumi says, uh, in times of affliction, a stretcher will come from grace. So and the Quran gives some pointers saying, you know, particularly in times of difficulties, remember two things. One is, sort of be in attendance in the divine court. Do your prayers, do your meditation. And number two, to the best of your capacity, be of service to others in any way you can. And then the Quran ends with some uh, uh, verses saying, you know, the earth was parched, but the waters of mercy came down and the earth was clothed in green. It goes on to say, it is God who sends down the rain when humankind has lost all hope and spirit unfolds its grace. As I've heard each of you talk about the need to have a more expansive view of what we are, what the possibilities of life might be, and the need to focus beyond just ourselves to others as we try to establish a broader community, an enduring community, uh, what comes to mind are those that are uh, very offended and 
striking out at this need to shelter in place, that view it as an assault on their personal freedoms. What is your reaction to that? My initial reaction is sadness. Um, it's not only the people who are seeing it as an assault on their personal freedom, but it's also those who are utilizing the realities of this time in destructive, in destructive ways. The attacks, for example, on the Zoom platform, which rightly needs to be called domestic terrorism. Um, the ways in which there are some among us, and, and tragically, a goodly number among us, who so experience themselves separate and disconnected that they're they are always subject to a radical polarization and uh, competition and uh, a fight, uh, somehow feeling disenfranchised and needing to assert themselves to have a sense of meaning and a sense of purpose. I see those who um, have been flaunting their uh, desire for social gatherings, irrespective of the damage that they may be doing, not only to themselves, but to each other, as a radical demonstration of what happens when we forget that we are connected, when we forget that we are responsible for each other. It's the old adage, you know, of the person who drills a hole underneath their seat in the boat. And when other people on the boat complain, the person says, no, no, it's just under my seat. It's just, I'm drilling it under my seat. And people say, yeah, but we're in the same boat. There is no other boat. As the Christian pastor um, of the three of us, so many of those people have been doing this in the name of Jesus as one, a desire to, to celebrate Easter. And it particularly burdens me when those claims that harm people are done in the name of a teacher who again and again said, love your neighbor as yourself. And by refusing the social distance, by gathering in a sanctuary to celebrate a day of, of, of life overcoming death, when you're actually engaging in an anti-life act, just grieves me. And um, to wrap that part up, it also honestly motivates me to do this type of work, to say to a, a secular world, those are not the only Christians out there. Those are not the only ones that are representing the way of Jesus in the world. Let's talk about another way. But maybe we can explain to them in more detail, appealing to their self-interest, that really uh, they're harming themselves uh, when they act so recklessly and also uh, they're harming their loved ones. Uh, it's not the other, it's their loved ones they're harming if they are not careful. So I think if we can explain in those terms uh, with compassion and appeal to their own self-interest, uh, I think it might bring about a change, we hope. As we uh, conclude this conversation and look forward to the time when the shelter in place uh, orders have been eased, we're able to circulate out at least in some sense and reestablish uh, physical community. Are there some psychological issues, some emotional issues that will begin to emerge at that time? And what would be the most skillful way that we could deal with those? I think the, the danger that I see is that what will start emerging is the desire to revert to old habits, to old patterns, to old conditioning to just leap wholeheartedly back into the consumerism of our culture, into the competitiveness of our culture, into the what essentially is a kind of separateness, even in without physical distancing, uh, that has marked our culture. But to tell you the truth, I think this time has pointed to a kind of physical vulnerability that is that needs to be honored and from which we need to learn to act differently in our world. I think we need wise leaders to help us emerge from this in a safe way. 
and I'll wait and see who those leaders are. As Brother Ted has said uh, several times, uh, it's so true, it's not gonna be back the way it was. So how will it be and who are those that are gonna help us understand the right way to be together to be safe? In my work with some people who are uh, suffering some psychological issues around this time, uh, I'll just mention two points. Uh, one is, uh, the fear is that once they come out of this lockdown, uh, the fear will continue, a uh, fear of the other. The other is contagious in some way. And uh, that's one issue. The other one is uh, some have got, gone into depression and the fear is that even if this lockdown is lifted, the depression continues. In, in fact, it can, can even, even become worse for a variety of reasons. So I think the best thing is to support those people who feel that sense of fear and that, that fear, sense of uh, enduring uh, depressive sadness. We have to come together as a community. Well, I thank each of you so much for joining together and forming this virtual community here and for all the work that you do as the uh, Northwest Interfaith Amigos. We are actually going to continue this conversation looking at the related issue uh, when we have to say goodbye to loved ones who go into a hospital and we can't visit them and the problems that that arises. That'll be in the next edition of Challenge 2.0. We thank all of you out there for joining us and hope that you'll all be well. Thank you very much.